I'm David Jordan Jr., Editor-in-Chief of Ishe Magazine, and today I'll be talking to New York Nick legend, Tennessee State legend, two-time NBA champion, three-time NAIA national champion, NAIA All-American, and this man also holds a PhD from Fordham University, Dr. Dick Barnett. How you doing today? Everything is good. Uh, look, looking forward to the looking forward to this interview. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to talk to you. You're from Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana has produced a lot of very successful black people in this world. Could you talk to us about your experience growing up in Gary? You know, you were born after, or were really during. Great Depression, and also during the time of Jim Crow and inter segregation. Well, and just well yes, I, I, I can give you, uh, fill you in with the, uh, being raised in Gary, Indiana, uh, from a very, uh, you might say, economic, economically, a, a very, very poor family. Uh, went to uh, Roosevelt High School in, in Gary, Indiana, and ironically, uh, David, uh, I really uh, began my uh, basketball career on the playgrounds of uh, Roosevelt High School and at the Friendship House in in Gary, Indiana, with. Uh, a ping pong ball and a tin cup. <laughs> I became very proficient uh, with that and uh, every, every, everything developed from there. Now, to get in the game playing with a uh, ping pong ball and tin can, I know that helps you develop a touch. Because if you can put it in a tin can with a ping pong ball, I know you can put it in a basket. <laughs> Well, I, I I think that's what uh, that that's what motivated the coaches to come and uh, uh, began uh, the contact with myself, and it really led to my meeting uh, coach uh, John McLennan. Obviously, he came to recruit me at that particular time uh, in 1955. Uh, the the South was uh, very, uh, we, we know the South was very much segregated when I went to, uh, when I went to Tennessee State. So we, uh, you had to change your whole lifestyle and your attitude. Gary wasn't as segregated as uh, Nashville, Tennessee at that particular time. Did you just play a lot in Gary growing up, or did you have a chance to go across to other cities and, and within the state and play against other competition? Well, we 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 played against the uh, competition from uh, Chicago. Chicago is only fifteen miles from Gary, so we we played against uh, a number of guys from Chicago. Roosevelt was. Uh, the only uh, black school in uh, in Gary out of about ten schools, and we were in the in, inner city. But but I had a chance to play everywhere in in, in Gary, so to uh, perfect my uh, uh, my motivation to to be a, a outstanding uh, basketball player. Yes, okay. you spoke of Coach McLendon who was essentially a student of James A., Dr. James A. Nathan, the inventor of the game. What was your experience like in your initial meeting with him and then playing for him and the words of wisdom that he imparted to you upon not only the court, but in life? Well, we, uh, we had a meeting. In fact, I met uh, Coach Magdalene on one very late night <laughs> that I was still out practicing um, basketball by myself, and uh, he had heard about that. And he was one of the best recruiters 
at that particular time, uh, since um, most outstanding players had to go to a, be recruited to go to a, uh, a black school. So um, I had an opportunity to meet uh, Coach Mike Glennon and, and we, we develop a, a excellent uh, relationship uh, through, through, through the years. And they, uh, uh, he came up with the assistant coach, Coach Mack, and recruited me to uh, come to Tennessee State. And obviously with my, uh, I had no uh, idea about uh, going to college and uh, on an athletic scholarship. And it, re it really changed my life a lot. Now going as you spoke of earlier, going to school in Nashville, which was the South. How was that adjustment for you? Had you ever been down South previously before enrolling at Tennessee State, which is then Tennessee? Not, not really. I mean, but I was, I was aware of, uh, sociologically, I was aware of what, what was transpiring in the South at that time. I was, uh, Re recruited to go to Tennessee State uh, the same year that uh, uh, Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi. So that was 1955. Did you have a relationship with any of the players prior to you arriving on campus? Did you Were you the only incoming freshman or were there others that no, were coming? Well, at, at that time, David, uh, one of the things that happened, and Coach Mike Lennon had recruited all staters from uh, all across the United States. So I really didn't know anybody in terms of playing uh, when, I, when I got there. Luckily, I developed a very good relationship with the president of Tennessee State, Dr. Walter Davis. Uh, and with that relationship with Coach Mike Linden, I, I kind of settled in and they made us aware uh, very quickly that the safest place, David, in Nashville in terms of race relations was uh, to be on the, the, the campus at Tennessee State. That, that was the safest place to be. And at that time, with... At, at, at that time, we, uh, we had to face, uh, uh, obviously, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, White Citizens Council, uh, um, Lester Maddox, you know, all those type of people, the segregationists that wanted to keep uh, the schools uh, all white, you know, so you, so you had to face those issues. Now with Fisk University up there, did you all ever interact with people on their campus as you all were two HBCUs within Nashville? Yeah, yes, we, yes, we did. Yes, Fish was about uh, 10 or uh, 20 minutes down Jefferson Street in Nashville. And uh, right across the street from the only black theater that, that we had to go to that was near the campus, uh, but even uh, in, in that theater, uh, you had to go around to the back and uh, go up some stairs. So, you know, that uh, white for whites only, for blacks only. So we had to face those particular issues that perhaps young people read about today. We, I had an opportunity to, to live that, uh, uh, that life when George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door saying segregation now and segregation forever. Now, with your playing career at Tennessee State, you became the school's all-time leading scorer. You all won three national NAI championships, All-American. As you were playing, and I know as a competitor that you wanted to always play against the best, play against other universities across the country. 
but also you all weren't really afforded it simply because of the color of your skin. Correct. How was it playing? And you know you're motivated to play against these other people that you don't have the opportunity to play against. What was the mindset? Well, the, the, the mindset, uh, David, was always uh, one of a, of, of a competitor. And, you know, I always felt that uh, uh, it, perhaps, uh, ho hopefully, uh, you, you probably know the, uh, the, the NCAA tournament and, and the NIT, uh, NAIA, the uh, the tournament that we won for three consecutive uh, college championships was the forerunner of the NCAA and the NIT. And as uh, I've indicated before, uh, once we won the NAIA in 1957, uh, our coach, uh, Coach Mike Linder, we wanted to play in the NCAA. We wanted to play against Bill Russell and his team, but they would not let us play at Madison Square Garden. And we won the second year, and we petitioned again. We wanted to play in the NIT at Madison Square Garden. Obviously, we were denied that opportunity again because of race, and we went back to uh, the NAIA and won it three consecutive years. We were the first team to ever win three uh, national championships at the college level. And uh, before UCLA began their run, and we won it without the accommodations, David, of public accommodations. We couldn't sleep in hotels. We couldn't eat in restaurants. We couldn't do the things that uh, people can do today. We had to relieve ourselves in cornfields along the way and uh, um, survive the best way we could uh, as we were playing college basketball across the South. Now, also during your time at TSU, towards the end of your attendance there, Wilma Rudolph attended there. Did oh, you have yeah. any type of interaction with her a lot? Oh, well, all, all the time. We, we, we were good friends on, on campus. Wilma, well, she was called Skeeter at Tennessee State, but uh, the world know, knows her as Will, uh, Wilma. And uh, obviously, she was very successful. And the coach, Coach Ed Temple, he was the coach of the Tiger Bells that developed that reputation in the Olympics that uh, uh, Wilma was, was so outstanding, exactly. And what was the best piece of advice that you received from Coach McClendon? From, from, from at Tennessee State? Yes, from Coach McClendon. What was the best piece of whether it's on court or off court advice that he gave that you that sticks in your head to this day? Well, it, it, uh, and, and I, I'm glad you you raised that question, David. That take to take uh, education very seriously. But even at that time, I, I didn't take uh, education very seriously. And to 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 bring you up to date, how how did I become Doctor Barnett? I really wasn't that that interested in education, let me tell you this, Edu basketball and sports, basketball was my, at, at uh, 18 and my early age was my mistress. I developed a romance with education because of a severe injury that I sustained as I was playing at Madison Square Garden. I often tell the story, the best thing that happened in my career, David, was sustaining and rupturing my Achilles tendon. Now that, that might sound, uh, uh, most, most people wouldn't, wouldn't consider that an asset, 
but that was a uh, that 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 turned my life around. When when I uh, ruptured my Achilles tendon at Madison Square Garden, and the uh, trainer came out and said, uh, told me, Big Barnett, you might not play any more professional basketball. And I had left Tennessee State, obviously, as a great player. But I left without a degree and not taking education seriously. I made a determination at that time, David, that I better go back to school and get ready for the future. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what transpired. That put me on the path to go back to school at Cal Poly in Pomona, California, and complete my uh, bachelor's degree in physical education. Uh, later on, I went on to uh, New York University to receive my master's degree uh, in, edu in education, and then went on to Fordham to get my doctorate degree. So that uh, uh, endeavor and the realization at that time that uh, education was very serious and Coach Mac Lennon stayed on, on, on me to really uh, try to change my life around, not only to be a, a great basketball player, but a productive citizen also. He indicated that Education was about three things, David, options, opportunities, and possibilities. And that's what I tell my young students when I became a professor at St. John's University. Those are great things because education, it's one, it's something you can control. And once you get it, nobody can take it from you. And like you said, it opens up opportunities that might not be present to somebody if they do not have the education? Well, one of the, one of the things that it made me do, it focused on, on, and I've always, I call myself the dream whisperer. Uh, I've always been infatuated with, what would I have done if I didn't play basketball? And, and uh, playing basketball and, trying to live my life, I developed a formula that, that the first thing was obviously, what, who am I? Who am I, David, as a black man in America? Who, who, who am I? Where did I come from? How, how did the, the Dred Scott decision impact my life? The Dred Scott decision said that you are not an American citizen, but you're a piece of property. So give, given that uh, realization and dealing with segregation and discrimination, so you had to adjust your life. You had to understand who you are. How did you come to be? So I developed my own, uh, uh, what uh, Abraham Lincoln say, uh, emancipation proclamation to live my dream. And, and the first part of that emancipation, David, was consciousness. Who am I as a black man in America? The second C, the five C's was commitment. I didn't want to uh, spend my life like most graduates uh, coming out of high school in Gary, Indiana in 1955. I didn't wanna work in the steel mill of Gary. I wanted to do something else. That's why I, I practiced unrelentingly, okay? And developed my dream. The second part of that dream paradigm, David, is commitment, not once a day, not once a week, Summer, winter, fall, rain, snow. Let, let, let me give you a, an example of uh, my 
um, commitment. I went to the court every day, honing my skills so I could make them pay. There were no off days and time to relax. My moves and my touch had to be exact. Four to five hours a day I would put in Rain, sleet, and snow was part of the toll. At the end of this ritual, my game was bad. My skills were complete. Everybody could be had. I was the talk and toast of the town. Handshakes, publicity, and offers abound. But my dedication David had a regrettable flaw. My classwork was shoddy. It was mostly my fault. And that was when at Madison Square Garden, the chickens came home to roost. October the 12th in Madison Square Garden when I ruptured my Achilles tendon and decided that I should take education very seriously. The third C of my formula, David, is conviction. What does conviction mean? The path that I'm taking is the right path for me. Got to be committed, committed. The fourth C, the fourth C. Courage. Tell young people you got to have the courage to say no. Anything that's going to challenge your dream and lead you on the wrong path, you got to have the courage to say no. That's not going to take me to where I want to go. And the fifth C is control. The only drug that I've ever had in, in my body was morphine. And that was, and that was for a very short period of time, David, to alleviate the pain uh, the, on uh, recovering from that ruptured Achilles tendon. And very fortunate, I was fortunate enough in those days, a ruptured Achilles tendon was usually the end of your career. That wasn't the days of modern medicine like today. But I was very fortunate. I recovered and came back and played for six or seven more years and became part of championship team at Madison Square Garden, having my uh, number retired and uh, developed in relationships with, with, with the teammates that have lasted 30 and 40 and 50 years. And I find, you know, that is such an ironic thing that in college, you all were trying to play in the national tournaments held at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and then on the highest level, you get the opportunity to play for the New York Knicks every night in the garden. At, at, at Madison Square Garden. At <laughs> Madison Square Garden. And your jersey will be hanging there forever, yeah. or you couldn't even play as a college athlete. Exactly. That, that, sh that shows you, and I tell young people, it's not where you began, it's where you, where you end, up, end up. Your dreams have, you, you got to have a, un a unquenchable thirst to live your dream, a unquenchable thirst. Yeah, and, and as I've, I've indicated, I've, I've had opportunities to go in other directions, but my dream was an anchor for, for my, my life of becoming uh, Dr. Barnett and doing some things and developing the Dr. Barnett uh, uh, foundation that I'm very much in, involved in at this particular time, David. During your MBA career, you played with and against some of the greatest players to ever play the game. 
And you had the opportunity to play on both coasts. You played in Los Angeles and you played in New York. Oh, oh so I played in, in mid, mid um, uh, America for one season with uh, David Stern, uh, David uh, Steinbrenner, who went on to own the New York Yankees and uh, uh, developed the Yankees. But uh, Played with uh, great players on, on the West Coast. Played with Elgin Bella and Jerry West with the Lakers, and you know against the great players, Oscar Robinson, uh, Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell, Casey Jones, Sam Jones. You know the list go, goes yeah. on and on of great players. Exactly. Now living in Los Angeles during your time playing with the Lakers. How was that experience where you, you came from Gary, you went to school in the <laughs> South, and then initially professionally you played on the East Coast with the Nationals, and then you got to live in California. How was that adjustment for you? What was, what was your expectation coming out to Los Angeles? Um, um, a major adjustment. I had never been to uh, spend any time on the West Coast and uh, develop uh, uh, you know, friendships on the, on the West Coast and met a number of people and I lived out there for, uh, until I got traded from, uh, from the, the Lakers to uh, the Knickerbockers. Uh, so uh, that, that impacted my life. And, and, and really uh, the, 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 the last, particularly during the, the, the virus, when uh, the, the whole year of 2020 was shut down, particularly in New York City, gave me an opportunity to develop uh, the Dr. Um, Richard Barnett uh, Foundation involved in providing internships for young people, scholarships for young people, working on uh, education, so, you know, it gave me a, a uh, opportunity to open doors to, to things that I'm doing and lecturing and, and still committed, involved in education. Exactly. And with this foundation, how can people become a part of it and contribute to helping and improving the lives that you're touching through the foundation? Well, one of the, even, and I'll, I'll give you that information in, in a moment, David. One of the things that we're doing, we, we're in, a, in, in a, uh, uh, we're, we're putting, and, and most people are, really don't even know about those championship teams that uh, be, before UCLA began their run, there's a documentary coming out that tells that story. So that will be coming out in the next month or so that will give an insight to what was transpiring in, in the South at that particular time with the, uh, not only the George Wallace's, but the White Citizens Council, Bull Connor, uh, Les Lex Lester Maddox, you know, some of the names that uh, uh, I, I, obviously, these were the forerunners of, of what we have now, the, the, the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys and the, the Goat Keepers and the Three Percenters and all of those people that affect uh, race in, 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 in a negative way. So... One, 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 one of the things that uh, we, we have just finished putting our website together uh, and, and we're putting uh, and they'll be able to reach all you've got to do is reach out and for Dr. Richard Barnett uh, found foundation and uh, that we, we will be able to uh, uh, give, give, give you the uh, telephone number and the way that we are contacted, but we're in the, David, we're in the embryonic stages of really putting this together, very excited. Uh, we'll still be dealing with the 
Commissioner Silva of the NBA and also uh, President Dolan of uh, Miles Square Garden and the 12 uh, franchises that make up uh, the franchises in New York City. So it's a very exciting time. I think that's a really great thing as you spoke about the documentary that you all will be putting out because it highlights some of the things that I think a lot of people, especially younger people today, don't really understand how things were in the right. very, very near past. Like 50 years is not a long time. Well, it, it's critical. Well, uh, you've got a, a number of young people that, you know, they perhaps, they, uh, their parents or grandparents or somebody in their family that might be older might be able to tell you about it. One, one of the things that happens with me I, I can, uh, you know, I only I played uh, obviously 15 years in the NBA, uh, and uh, really, uh, even before the reserve clause and free agents and people started making generational money. So one of the things that most people are not familiar with. That's why we're we're excited about it. Most historical black colleges really don't even know the, this story. And in fact, uh, David, you have a number of young people, and I've been talking to the president of, of, of Tennessee State. You got a number of uh, young people at Tennessee State that really don't know the Tennessee State history. Okay, one, one of the things that we're trying to do, and, I, and I've written a book on, on that episode, uh, that, that that should be required reading of every student that comes into Tennessee State so you can become familiar with some of the, some of the things that 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 we were able to accomplish exactly and and Walter Davis the president re was really the architect of putting that whole athletic program together and hiring uh, coach Mike Lennon to come to Tennessee State that's great because, you know, it's essential to know and understand the history of where you are so that you can build upon it and go forward with everything that you're trying to do in your life. The students that, need that. No question about that. No question about that. We, 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 we should know about uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. We, we should know about the owl of no return come from Africa. We should know about the, the middle passage. And, and we should know about uh, 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 white racism and, and, and some of the things that have commanded our existence and, and, and our, in our lives. So, you know, we have to deal with white supremacy and white privilege every day in America. Now, delving back to education, you were a professor in college. Yes. But as you stated, when you were a student athlete, you didn't really care about your academics that much. So <laughs> what were your classes like in having discussions with students? Because I'm sure you probably saw students yeah, that you had- mean, when, I was, when I was a professor at St. John's? Yes, sir. Oh, no, when I, I made that, no, I, the story that I told about, uh, uh, the chickens came home to roost. I tell that to my students, and 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 I tell that story, and and that 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 was the best thing that happened to me at a young age. That Achilles tendon put that that was a wake up call. That was a wake up call. I said Dick Barnett, you better get you better get ready for the future. You you're not going to be playing basketball uh, forever. You better get ready. For the future, and I'm very grateful for that. I I had I, I think I had the uh, the academic uh, 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 I could do the work, but I, I was just so infatuated uh, and and uh, by being a, a, a athlete and all that kind of stuff, and I really didn't take education very seriously at that time. Exactly. But, but I tell, as a professor at St. John's, 
that was that was part of my uh, uh, presentation to my students. I I, I gave them that uh, that that background of uh, what what really changed my life and and to become. I never thought about being a a uh, professor at, at at a major college. That that never even entered my mind. And I, you know, I wasn't an outstanding student in in high school. I, I, all I wanted to do was uh, be somebody, play ball, and have and, and basketball changed my life around. That's great because you know it's a lot of times that we sometimes end up in situations to help people that we didn't foresee ourselves being in, but it's so impactful and much more impactful than what we thought we. Were. Well, well, there's no question about that. I've had a number of young people that I I, I, I didn't know at all that uh, stopped me in, on the street and said, aren't you Dr. Barnett? And some of the things that you, you've done in your life have impacted my behavior and, and made me really want to go back to school and, and finish my education and finish my, and put my, my dream paradigm together. Exactly. And now to the Knicks this year, they've been finding some success you know, <laughs> bouncing, bouncing back. That, 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 that has been a uh, inspiration within itself. No one, uh, given the last couple of decades, uh, but with the hiring of, of, of new uh, uh, people in the basketball department by, by uh, President Dolan, They've been they they they've been successful and obviously had surprised the league. Whoever thought, uh, given today's uh, Knicks, that uh, they they would win nine games in a row, right. and nine out of ten. And I mean, so uh, uh, and 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 it looks like they're going to make the playoffs. So I'm going to be over there to to watch them play and encourage them. And in fact. Uh, I, I might be doing something with the Knicks in the future. I've had conversations with uh, uh, the president uh, in, in, in that regard. As we see the NBA today, from when you played, what is the one thing that you see that has been an advancement in the game, whether it's been you know technology, medicine, or evolution of the game? Well, I, 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 I think, I think you, 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 you named it. When, uh, to, to, to give you a little background, when the, the health situation, that, that was no uh, players association when I came to the NBA. There, there was no, no uh, health insurance. There were no doctors at games. There, there was no, uh, we, we were tied uh, 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 we, 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 we were tied to, to a clause that, uh, that you had to be tied to in pet, in, 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 and there was no way of getting out. The only, the only way you could get out was to say, I'm not going to play, I'm going to sit out. So, you know, so the whole, the whole thing has changed, David. Uh, and, and with the money, people are now are making generational wealth that will take care not only of them, but their children and their families. So uh, nobody ever thought that people would be making $200 uh, uh, million dollars in for a three-year contract. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, this is unbelievable. So, you know, uh, when, when I came in, I, I was uh, relegated to what they call the reserve clause. The owners had, uh, you, you you, you, you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't negotiate a new contract. So everything has changed. Health, money, everybody's making money in the NBA, even assistant coaches, coaches, everybody is making. The whole league has changed. The, the impact of it has become a, not only uh, with the, with the it's become a international sport, a, a worldwide sport. So, you know, so the whole thing has changed dramatically. And during, the, did you have to work in the summer? I know a lot of players then work part-time jobs during the summer. Yeah, and off yeah, definitely you had to work in the summer. 
I mean, you, you, you know, uh, uh, my, my contract, uh, had, and, and I always tell, and I was telling my students, see, to, to, to show you the difference in lifestyle and contract, my contract, uh, number one, first of all, that, that was the quota system back in those days, David. Very few black players not only could get drafted, but you didn't play, you, 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 were, you wasn't able to play. So one, one of the things that happened was I signed a contract for uh, first round draft choice out of Tennessee State, uh, $7,200. That, that was my contract compared to a contract today. So, you know, that shows you how things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. There, there was no players association. Uh, uh, there were no chartered flights on, on planes and players have meals on. You had to catch uh, a railroad train going city to city. The, try to get a commercial flight if you could. So, you know, things have changed. Obviously, uh, uh, the NBA has become, they're, they're one of the major generators, uh, avenue streams of, 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 of money in the American economy. So obviously they have become like a major league of baseball, hockey, uh, and, and the NFL become major, major in terms of the economy. Now, you're also an author. You're a published author. Could you talk to uh, us about your book? Uh, I've I, I published uh, at least uh, 20 books, and uh, they're, they're going to be, so we, we're putting up, uh, finishing up, as I, as I indicated, finishing up the website. Uh, people will have a chance to uh, See, see what the books are, poetry, uh, uh, other issues that, uh, that uh, I wish to, to, to face. In, in, in fact, uh, I, I just finished a, another short, short book called We, we the People, and it, it deals with uh, uh, race and everything else. So, it, it's been a fascinating transformation uh, and becoming not only a basketball player and a professor at St. John, but uh, a father and, and, and everything else. So uh, the, the friendships, ironically, the friendship that one developed as a athlete and with teammates still have uh, those that are still uh, alive still have that relationship with my old high school teammates, with the teammates at Tennessee State, and then the teammates at the, at the, in the NBA. One, one of the things that made me uh, know that I was good at basketball, my, my jersey was retired at high school, Gary Roosevelt. Uh, my jersey was retired at Tennessee State and then my jersey was retired at Tennessee State. So all along the way, I paid the price and uh, uh, was able to reach and live my dream. Well, again, it's been such an honor to talk to you about your life, your career, your education, your foundation, and everything that you've done that's essentially enabled me to be doing what I'm doing today. And I'm forever grateful for that. And I want to wish you the best of luck with everything going forward. Well, I, I love to stay in contact. I'm, I'm glad you, you're in the business, uh, David. And I'm glad that uh, you, you're doing what, what, what you're doing. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to, to talking to you again, particularly once... Uh, uh, the documentary come out. I'm going to be uh, talking to uh, uh, every historical black college is giving them the insight on how all of that transpired in those days.